Good morning, North America. Good afternoon, Europe, and good evening, Asia. My name is Andrew Schulz, and I'm the global head of ocean freight and trucking here at the Flexport. I'm super excited to spend the next 45 minutes with uh, with all of you. We have a lot to talk about. Uh, we are currently taking a look at the wavy ocean markets right here. What are we seeing right here? What now? What have we seen the past couple of months, and what do we predict in the in the coming weeks and uh, and month? As usual, um, the ocean markets. Uh, or at least the past couple of years, they have been very, very volatile, very dynamic. So please uh, take a look at this disclaimer right here. What we talk about today, all the facts we present, all the sort of expectations, the predictions, take it sort of uh, for, for what it is. Don't hold us accountable for it. We're trying to just, you know, share uh, the best uh, of our knowledge. Uh, but please take it with a, with a grain of salt. Um, today, I'm being joined by uh, two phenomenal uh, speakers right here. Florian Brown, who heads up uh, Ocean in uh, the EMEA region for Flexport. Uh, welcome to you, uh, Florian. Hi, good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. Then we have uh, Nathan Strang, Director uh, of Ocean at, uh, at North America for Flexport. Uh, Nathan is a usual suspect uh, on, on our webinars, uh, also a, uh, a popular uh, LinkedIn uh, writer. So if you want the latest and greatest on uh, North America, especially at the destination level, please uh, follow Nathan, always sharing uh, tons of valuable insight. Welcome to you, uh, Nathan. Hey, thanks, Anders. Good morning uh, and welcome to everybody. Cool. So let's um, take a look at the agenda. We've tried to sort of keep it uh, very, very simple, yet yet meaty, uh, given the, the nature of the topics. First and foremost, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at the, the current uh, ocean markets. Uh, what are we seeing um, out there at the moment? Uh, also hand in hand with the uh, economic uh, sort of indicators at the macro trend level um, we're seeing we're seeing out there. Then we'll talk about the, the future expectations, uh, what to expect given some of these macro trends, and then finally, what are some of the the low hanging uh, recommendations we have in front of us uh, based on the uh, uh, recommendations from uh, Florian, Nathan, uh, and myself. And we are not going to end up with a Q and A in this webinar. We have a pretty uh, Sort of uh, hefty um, uh, data data pack in, in, in front of us. Um, in return, we will uh, make sure that all of your uh, written questions get attended either uh, instantly online as a part of this webinar, where everyone else can see the answers. The questions uh, we uh, won't get to in writing, we will follow up in email just to make sure that you all get answers to your questions. Um, but we have a few flex porters available in app. Uh, that are able to to answer all your questions. Then, as usual, uh, you're more than welcome to download the deck and follow up uh, to each of uh, Nathan, Florian, and myself, for that matter, uh, right after the webinar or later. We're more than happy to engage and get more intel from uh, from all of you. Let's uh, let's take a look at the um, the overall picture on what we're seeing in the world of uh, in, in the world of ocean freight at the moment. The past two years, as uh, you are uh, all acutely aware, we have seen more demand than uh, than, than actual uh, ocean space out there. That's why we've had you know a, a gap uh, depicted in the graph. But what's interesting uh, is uh, at this point in time, and basically uh, the past uh, couple of months and weeks, we've seen uh, the blue line, um, which is demand for space, and the red line, actual space after uh, blank sailings and whatnot, skip sailings. We've actually seen those two uh, lines uh, meeting for the first time or those two lines crossing for the first time in, in two years. The devil is in the detail as usual, trade by trade, port pair by port pair. But at the moment, uh, demand and, 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 and space available are sort of like coming together. We're no longer seeing the picture we've seen for the past straight two years where we basically had give or take 20% more demand than actual uh, vessel space out there. So um, the environment has changed and uh, is expected to to continue to, to change. Now, what's driving some of this? Let's let's look into um, some of the some of the, the the indicators we're seeing out here. In the in the following chart here, um, we've depicted North America uh, retail levels in terms of inventories and inventory to sales ratio. What's interesting is you can see the blue line inventory levels uh, at the retail uh, level have continued to increase. And all of this data we're showing here in the solid line uh, lines comes with a two month lag. So we have tried to basically predict um, the future a little bit with the dotted uh, blue and, and, and green lines here based on the leading indicators that we're seeing ahead of us in Flexport, um, which we'll also talk about a little bit later on in the presentation. 
What's very interesting is the green line and the development of same. You can see that the solid green line is still hovering around um, you know, levels that are lower than pre-pandemic levels in terms of inventory uh, to sales ratios uh, for retail um, uh, commodities. But what's interesting is the dotted uh, green lines based on the leading indicators we're seeing, we actually expect inventory to sales uh, ratios to uh, meet or even exceed uh, historical uh, levels in the in the month to come. A lot more insights on uh, on why that's the case, but at least that's the that's how we're seeing things at the high level. Before going into uh, what we're seeing here in terms of our data, our analysis, we would love to learn from all of you how you are seeing it. Um, so let's do a quick uh, let's do a quick, quick pulse check on uh, on inventory levels um, out there. So um, let's uh, let's get the questions uploaded um, and then uh, pulse check all of you. How much uh, has your inventory changed in the past two months? Has it increased fifty uh, percent or more? Increased twenty five to fifty percent? Is it an increase of zero to twenty five percent? No significant change or has it uh, has it decreased even? So please uh, take um, 10, 10 seconds or so to select one of the one of the five uh, options here, and then let's take a, take take a look at the uh, at the outcome to see uh, how uh, the statistics stack up. All right, let's take a look at the, the outcome here. Okay, so it looks like uh, most selections uh, are anchoring around uh, 25 to 50 percent increase uh, and and zero to 20 25 percent increase. Um, I can see the, the the results are slightly changing uh, as as more and more votes are coming in. Let's uh, let, let's uh, check with you, Nathan and Florian. How do you see this? Is this surprising relative to what you're reading out there and from your many uh, client conversations? Nathan. Yeah, so when talking to most clients um, in the past couple of weeks, we have seen inventory overstock as one of the big driving factors in their shipping frequency. Um, what I think is even more interesting is it's not even necessarily that the uh, individual client is, but sometimes their end user is. So if they're shipping into a big box retailer, um, if they're shipping into a distribution point, that location may be over inventory, even though the client is not over inventory, but we can see how that trickles down the supply chain and then drives into um, the, the forward looking projection for our clients. <clears throat> yeah, we're time. seeing a similar trend. Um, I mean, especially turnaround times uh, between ports, uh, customer facility and back has increased a lot. And, and, and that is related to uh, uh, full warehouses not being able to turn basically containers as fast as, as, as customers used to. This is one of the key learnings. Uh, we have customer conversations, so I guess there is an increasing stock, at least on, on, on certain uh, products. Great, thanks for sharing that valuable insight, uh, both of you. Let's uh, let's move on uh, for a second and, and take a look at some of the data and some of the analysis we've been doing here in, in Flexport. Um, so what we're seeing um, right here is um, an analysis we did on um, the different uh, the different verticals, the different commodities out there relative to how much they make up in terms of uh, containerized um, um, import. So uh, when you look at the pie chart right here, you can see that 80% of uh, historical import volumes, they actually uh, come from sectors with, with excess inventory, uh, most predominantly retail, um, which makes up close to half of, uh, of total import, uh, but also largely driven by uh, electronics and, and other verticals. If we then make the assumptions that, uh, that orders are being cut by say 10%, for example, um, it actually translates into more than 45,000 TUs of container uh, capacity uh, not, not being needed in the market, which is effectively 8% of available import uh, capacity at the weekly level, both uh, in terms of imports into North America and uh, Europe. So obviously, as orders are, are being cut, it's quite uh, dramatic how much it, it actually impacts um, the, the supply and demand balance, if you look at it from, from this perspective. And, We've also done another analysis where we've looked into uh, some big box retailers uh, and their inventory to, to sales ratios. Uh, Nathan, it would be super valuable if you wouldn't mind uh, taking us through the highlights on, the, on this one. 
Yeah, I think that we've seen a lot of this coming through in the news, um, the over inventory story, right? So um, a lot of this inventory, um, some of it is, I'm sorry, some of this inventory is pulled forward. So in anticipation of congestion, possible slowdowns on the West Coast through labor negotiations, a lot of these um, larger retailers were able to pull forward inventory and, and bring in safety stock. Um, that is uh, part of it. Another one is just um, anticipation that consumer buying habits weren't going to change very much um, year over year. So their forecast for their models um, said that they needed to order more cargo and, and more goods coming in. And then um, lastly, you know, obviously just the, the overall slowdown that did happen. So goods that were already on the shelf, not moving. We have seen that this isn't uniform though. It's, it's largely driven by certain sectors of goods. Um, and anyone can see that if you go shopping at the store, you'll notice that there's plenty of one item nothing of something else. So that is also creating an interesting imbalance because as the stores are full, their warehouse is full, it's really hard to actually fix that, that balance as well. And clearly, if these stores are overstocked, then the clients shipping into them are also going to be overstocked. It's going to, as we said earlier during the poll, it's going to trickle back into, um, into the stocks of, of the suppliers to these. And I think that that's a piece of data that is much harder to find, but that we're clearly seeing um, as driving the market. Makes sense. How about Europe, uh, Florian? How do you see this? Is this sort of a one-to-one -one comparison? A lot of the retailers we've outlined here, uh, big sort of American big box retailers. Uh, how do you see it in Europe? Different or same story? I mean, we don't have the, uh, as good data as we have in the US, but uh, uh, prices for food and energy have increased quite a bit. Additionally, you've got the war in Ukraine, which has added a lot of uh, insecurity to consumer spending. So overall spending is down, except for travel and, 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 and tourism. Um, the, the spending, especially down in the areas like for, for furniture and home appliances, I think that was expected uh, um, uh, due to the boom last year. But even spending for food and groceries is, is down uh, due to the high inflation. And this is pointing towards a bigger problem in consumer spending. Um, Overall, the, the, we see a reduction of around 6%, uh, um, which means on a stationary retail uh, environment, we're in the same level as February 21. And this is where a lot of shopping restrictions due to the COVID uh, um, um, virus. So I think that retail is, 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 is not in a good spot currently. And additionally, like I mentioned, we see cont container turnaround times increasing because of, of full inventories. So I, I, I would say it's safe to it's safe to say that we're in a very similar situation as we are in the US. Got it. Thanks for, for that insight. So somewhat similar picture with slight nuances on, on food in, uh, in particular. All right, let's um, let's move on. So how is all of this translating into freight prices uh, or, or rates? Um, obviously, the a narrow sort of uh, supply and demand gap uh, driven by by a slower consumption has indeed uh, seen it, its impact on, on the rate environment, right? As you can can, can all see here, we have uh, depicted uh, where rates uh, climbed uh, up to in terms of peak levels uh, driven by these so-called premium rates, where in some cases we saw rate levels exceeding a, a staggering $20,000 per 40-foot container um, on, 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 on the imports uh, to, to the U.S. East Coast, right? And then we have effectively seen rates uh, in, in, in some corridors uh, come, come down 50%. Uh, the end of the graphs here actually shows the, 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 the current effective moving rates where most uh, of the cargo uh, is moving on, on standard floating uh, rates uh, as opposed to premium rates. But this is a sort of a complicated matter. Uh, you don't necessarily see these premium rates uh, in the past in the different indices. So. Nathan, help us understand all of this complexity. What have we seen in the past? Uh, what are we seeing now? How to sort of like uh, juggle the complexity of all these indices? Yeah, I think one of the trends that we saw during the pandemic was the split between what we would call the moving rate um, and the index rate, right? So how much you would pay for the cargo to actually, you know, move on a service versus what the indexes were tracking, which would be your standard spot rate. Um, what was the difference? And that was those premium services, things like no roll, um, uh, increased availability at the port, such as an on wheels service or an early outgate service, um, expedited rail services, things like that, that weren't necessarily reflecting very well in the rates. Um, and we're also causing a little bit of, of issue in projecting where rates were going to go. What we've seen now is 
the moving rate and the spot rate are coming much closer together as those premium services are kind of falling out of the industry. There are still what I would call the traditional premium services, and those are the fast boat services, the on-wheel services, which are still performing and are still um, very valuable to clients who are booking into those because they are the truly faster services in the market. But those kind of um, um, access services where you're paying for no roll, uh, special equipment, um, priority discharge, those are kind of leaving the market now um, as consumers become more price uh, sensitive. And obviously with the inventory overstock, time is not as critical as it, as it was. Nathan, how about all these extra loaders and, and newer services that have entered the Trans-Pacific market uh, the past two years? How do you see them uh, developing the, 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 the coming months? Yeah, uh, as demand falls, uh, I believe we'll see the, the interest in extra loaders start to fall, um, which, which could be a good thing. We're seeing that also in these services, there's, there's just not as much capacity to run these weekly services. So returning those extra loaders to mainline service will help also improve efficiency. But I don't expect extra loaders um, to be as plentiful. We've already seen a lot of the charter services that were very popular last year um, start to leave the market. Uh, the the multi-purpose ships going into the smaller ports, um, those services are already being canceled. Um, again, that'll drive rates down actually because those also came at a premium. Those were those were above the the spot rate services when when you looked at their their overall price. Interesting, Florian. How is this from a, from a European perspective? Uh, on the European, uh, so Asia to Europe trade, we don't have these classic uh, uh, premium services like on the Trans-Pacific from, from, from China to the US. It's um, um, the, the, a lot of more port calls in between, so, so those uh, um, extra fast services do not exist. But we had uh, um, during the COVID peak, of course, as you can see, when freight rates peaked nearly towards uh, $20,000, there was basically the moving rate in order to get your uh, uh, cargo on, on the vessel more reliably. However, since origin operations, uh, especially in China, has uh, considerably in, improved, uh, so the, the, the origin operations are, are nearly back to, back to normal, there's also the, the demand for the services uh, not there anymore. So the effective moving rate I would look at, so to say, is the, around $15,000 um, um, pre-Chinese New Year. And now we're looking basically a, a spot rate of around $10,000. So there's a 50% decrease. And that's um, related to less port congestion in Asia, uh, but also a, a slightly weakening demand. Got it. Thanks, Warren. Let's move on for a second and, and look at the comparison between uh, the floating and the fixed annual contract rates on uh, Trans-Pacific and Asia to Europe. So first, on the left side, we see uh, the development of floating rates relative to the fixed rates on Trans-Pacific, where they have climbed, uh, floating rates have climbed to you know, a level of give or take a $1,000 uh, lower than fixed. Um, but the devil is in the detail, port pair by port pair, especially when it comes to some of the inland uh, rates. Uh, there we are still seeing fixed rates being higher than floating. And then actually on uh, Asia Europe, we're seeing the reverse picture where um, fixed rates um, are still uh, lower uh, than, than floating rates. Nathan, sort of help us sort of, understand how to navigate this. What are sort of your tips and tricks here? Because fixed rates are obviously, you know, yep. fixed uh, for a reason. They're reliable rates, so they don't fluctuate uh, similar to floating rates. So how to navigate this um, this environment on the Trans-Pacific? Let's, uh, let's perhaps start there and get, get your recommendations. Yeah, it's interesting because if you look at the chart back on May 1st, you can see that the spot rate was above the fixed rate, and that was kind of what we anticipated. I don't think anybody anticipated that the, the rates would fall this this rapidly below below the level, but it is seasonal. This is the time of year when you would see those rates start to invert um, prior to coming into peak when they would move back up again. Um, as you mentioned, IPI is still a, you know, if you're moving into Chicago, Kansas City, Memphis, those rates, uh, the, the fixed rate is still lower than the spot rate um, due to demand and congestion at those. Um, how do you navigate this? So I think if you're a, a client who has a fixed contract, one of the things to remember that it's not just the rate, it's a space. So these rates come with kind of head of the line space. They come with access. So if you decide to move away from your fixed contracts and move and take care, uh, take advantage of the spot market, um, you may not have those fixed contracts available to you when peak hits, the rates invert or space becomes uh, an issue. The, the carriers are going to look to the rate levels and making decisions on loading cargo. And if they see a fixed rate um, versus a spot rate, that fixed rate is going to load ahead of that spot rate. 
Um, again, it's an individual decision on the part of on the part of a shipper as to where their risks lie. If your immediate risk is is in rates and not in space, um, just understand that that immediate risk may not translate um, well into preparing for risk down the road if the rates again do come up or if space does become a premium as we go into peak season. That's good. That's good context, Nathan. And interesting, you, you say uh, when peak hits. Uh, I think that's the million dollar question, right? We'll discuss that a little bit later as to whether. Uh, both the audience and uh, uh, the, the three of us feel that uh, a, a peak is coming or not. But be beforehand, uh, Florian, uh, the, the, the picture is slightly different uh, on, uh, on on the Europe trades. Uh, how, how do you see this and how to navigate it? Yeah, so the, the currently the spot rate is still above the, the, the contracted rate. So um, seasonality-wise, you would expect a, a decrease after Chinese New Year into, into June. This is also what, what, what we saw, which is reflected in the, in the graph that we see here. However, as, of, um, as from July onwards, um, that would be traditionally a peak into, into Europe, but um, rates have flattened out and so have, has, has demand. So I don't want to uh, take it up front, but this peak doesn't seem, seem, seem to happen. So I do anticipate a, um, a further drop in, in, in spot rates, temporarily, maybe even below the contract rate. Um, so what does it mean for, 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 for the customer? Um, I would say the situation is um, um, unclear um, as we have like uh, opposing trends um, the, a short term dip below the uh, contracted rate is possible. However, um, this can change very, very fast. So and, and if you if you have contracted rates, I, I, I would stick to it at least with, with, with part of the volume as you don't want to move into the spot market because this will not translate, the current situation will not translate in, in, into the future. Um, or it's very insecure if it will. So um, despite the fact that you currently see softening spot rates, um, I anticipate that the contracted rate will be the better deal over the year. Interesting. Thanks for thanks for sharing. Let's let's take a pulse check with the, the audience uh, on, on how uh, on how you all see it. Um, so let's uh, let's upload the questions here on uh, on how to navigate uh, fixed versus uh, floating rates. So we have the following question: How much volume are you booking on your fixed contracts in the current market? More than contracted volume, if you have indeed contracted fixed space, equal to contracted volume, less than contracted volume, don't have any fixed rates. Uh, would love to learn from all of you. Uh, please uh, select one of the four options right here. We'll give you five, 10 seconds. All right, let's take a look at the, uh, let's take a look at the outcome. Okay, very interesting. So close to 60% um, do not have fixed rates. Uh, I guess that's a good thing, at least at the moment on, on, tra on trend specific, but may not uh, be a good thing if we indeed see a Q3 peak where the floating rates could climb back up above the fixed levels. Um, and then of course the reverse story on, um, on Asia Europe. Uh, any, uh, any commentary here, uh, Nathan Florian, um, any, any reactions? If not, we'll, uh, we'll move on. We have a lot of, of, of additional media topics. All right, let's uh, let's keep going. Thanks for that uh, insult, everyone. Okay, so supply and demand um, in terms of um, 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 you know vessel space uh, from from a supply perspective, obviously go uh, very much hand in hand with with blank or skipped sailings that we have seen you know increase to. Um, a historical high uh, for the past uh, two years, basically, during the COVID economy. Uh, what we are seeing, though, on, 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 on most trades is that uh, the, the, the blank sailing or the skipped sailing percentages are coming down somewhat um, as of lately um, across trades. Nathan, how, how to uh, read this um, in terms of uh, Asia to, to, to North America and what to expect? Yeah, I think um, one of the big things that was driving blanks um, over the past two years was congestion on the West Coast. When we saw the, the vessel backlogs at, at Los Angeles and Oakland, uh, PNW and Vancouver, um, those vessels sitting for two weeks, uh, it's obviously going to cause service disruptions and, and blank sailings. Um, and, and similar to the East Coast, when you see issues at Savannah, New York um, right now. 
However, as service improves, um, you are seeing these blanks um, start to decrease. Uh, this is a good thing. Uh, about 50% of global trades uh, are under uh, staffed with vessels, so they don't have enough vessels to maintain their regular schedule frequency. So as blank sailings come down, we mentioned extra loaders starting to come out of the market, service reliability will go up. Uh, that's a really good thing. Uh, we also saw, see a trend on the West Coast of vessel size. During the pandemic years, uh, 2020 and 21, the average vessel size was around 7,000 uh, TEU. We're now seeing them move up into the 10,000 TEU region, which is more expected. Uh, so vessel efficiency, less vessels coming in per week is good. Um, less handling, uh, less congestion at the terminals. And, and overall, this, this should be a good thing for when we look at service reliability going forward for this year. Great. Thanks for sharing that, Nathan. Let's take a look at uh, the Europe trades uh, and, and how that compares. Warren, over to you. <clears throat> I mean, the same as uh, to the US market, we saw a spike in, in, in blank savings, of course, during the, the, the COVID time. However, now if you look into uh, uh, 2022, we had a, um, um, still quite a few blank savings uh, um, till, till Chinese New Year and, and also due to the Shanghai uh, um, uh, a lockdown. But right now for July, um, there's very few uh, blank sailing announcements, so on average, um, one to three maximum sailings are, are, are blank. However, depending on the situation, that can change really, really quickly. I mean, it's an announcement of two weeks nowadays and, 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 and sailings can, can be blank. But right now, it, it looks like that um, more stability will, will come into the trade. Um, if you look from to, to Europe to North America, this is a totally, totally different market. It's mainly driven by the industrial engineering sector, by automotive or commodities like, like chemicals. Here we still have a, a quite a strong, strong demand and due to the um, a port congestion in, in, in Hamburg and other European ports, there has been a, a spike in, in, in blank sailings um, beginning of this year. It came down, but now um, from July onwards, also seeing more blank sailings being announced on the transatlantic in order to restore um, um, the schedule integrity. Thanks, Florian. Okay, let's um, let's look at, uh, at at the transit time across some of the three uh, key trade lanes out there: um, China to uh, LA, China to New York, and China to Rotterdam. I think, as, as most are acutely aware, transit times have been uh, reaching. Um, I mean, highs we've never seen before in, in our industry. Uh, in some cases, they doubled or tripled uh, from cargo ready date uh, until the goods were received at the at the warehouse destination. Uh, what's positive, uh, as you can see in the chart here, and um, as uh, I'm sure you're, you're, you're all feeling day to day in your, in your, in your global supply chains, uh, the good news is that it has been reduced uh, significantly uh, the past uh, the past um, six months. It's still, uh, it's still very high relative to historical levels, but uh, the TLDR right here is that the, the, the total transit times have sort of on average been, been shortened by 35% as congestion uh, eases to, to, to some extent. The big question is uh, to what extent and how fast uh, are we expecting them to, to drop uh, in, the, in the weeks and, the, and months to, uh, to, to come? How much further will the uh, transit times uh, come down? We have a few slides uh, talking about some of the, 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 the sort of projections we're seeing at the land side uh, in terms of the congestions we've seen the past two years. So let's uh, let's uh, let's keep going. Um, in terms of uh, global schedule reliability, as both um, Nathan and Florian alluded to, uh, we can see on the left chart here that um, despite um, some um, improvement in the global supply chains. Um, the global schedule reliability uh, from carriers uh, are still hovering around historical lows of, uh, of 34%. There is a bit of a lag in this data point because it dates back to, to April. We should see um, a slight improvement in the month of uh, May and, and June. But it's still very, very clear that uh, the schedule reliability remains historical low uh, for a number of reasons. Um, on the right chart here, we have basically shown uh, some of the disruptions uh, at, at origin, where essentially uh, we're seeing continuous uh, delays from the uh, scheduled uh, departure date um, uh, relative to actual departure date. But Nathan, uh, please help us understand the metric we have depicted here on the right side, because the devil's in the detail, how to read this chart, would love your, your insight. 
Yeah, Origin Port Dwell is something that actually I, I think is a kind of undertracked, um, especially being here in North America. We we tend to look at the dwell at the ports uh, ports here. When you look at the Origin Dwell, a lot of this um, is driven by local conditions. And if you see that spike there, um, that's Chinese New Year. So obviously, you know, Chinese New Year is going to cause some disruptions there as as ports close and, and people go on holiday and, and factories. Um, and then there's another spike in there. It's a little bit harder to see, but the COVID spike, right? So um, if you're looking at all of Asia, that little spike is pretty significant because it's really driven by just one port when we're looking at Shanghai's shutdown. So um, a lot going on there um, in terms of in terms of backups. Um, and, and these backups also compound, and that's another reason why schedule reliability in general is taking a long time to come back. If you consider your morning commute, if there's an accident, you'll be backed up. You'll be like, why is there so much traffic? You'll get to a point and you'll see that the accident has cleared a half hour to an hour ago, but you're still in traffic. So any backup and slowdown is going to compound. And we really need multiple weeks of reliable service and back to normal before we can see a recovery in both origin port dwell and schedule reliability. Thanks, Nathan. You mentioned Shanghai. Um, we've actually... Um, outline that as one of the hotspots in the, in the graphic right here. Thorin, enlighten us on, on the latest uh, around the Shanghai uh, situation. Uh, where are we today relative to where we were a month, uh, a month ago? So port operations has always uh, um, uh, continued almost normal in, in, in Shanghai, but um, due to the lockdown, there was a, a shortage in trucking and uh, the drivers weren't able to get into the port and a lot of restrictions. So. Um, that caused quite a bit of uh, um, um, volume decline out, out, of, out of Shanghai. If you look at the total um, situation from China in, into Europe, like the, the origin operations has improved a lot compared to a few, few months back. So what we, what we currently see is um, mainly um, a, a building port congestion, uh, a, a Specifically in Hamburg, there is some severe anchoring delays. Yeah? So currently, there are 15 vessels, far east westbound, so far east vessels waiting outside uh, um, uh, on the ocean uh, to, to call Hamburg. And if you think that one vessel has maybe 20,000 use capacity, you can imagine how much cargo is waiting in, in, in front of Hamburg. And that is uh, indeed basically um, bringing down overall schedule reliability. Again, now the problem is at destination, at least in, in, in Germany, and not so much at the origin anymore. In um, Rotterdam and also other ports like Antwerp, uh, Bremerhaven, um, you see high terminal utilization, but you don't have as severe anchoring delays as you see, see in Hamburg. So if you are able to uh, alternate, use to, to alternate your port of destination, so a strong recommendation currently, uh, choose Wilhelmshaven um, as intermodal transport has uh, improved dramatically and also um, Bremerhaven basically a lot better than uh, than Hamburg at the moment. Go on, tell us a little bit more about what's driving these destination delays in Hamburg, uh, etc. So it's a it's a combination of of <clears throat> of, of um, um, schedule delays. You've got a, a lot of large vessels arriving at the same time, and they should uh, be right, arrive in a, a specific sequence. Um, additionally, the the Ukraine war has led to to a lot of abandoned cargo that was consigned to Russia. Those containers are then congesting the, the terminal and they bring down the uh, operational efficiency a lot. So, I mean, ocean carriers, terminals, uh, freight forwards are, are working hand in hand to resolve that. Uh, but it has, especially in Hamburg, in combination with some, some, some really bad weather, has led to a, a major, major con congestion. But as, as I said, like um, other ports like Wilhelmshaven, Bremerhaven, and also Rotterdam are somewhat better. So. Uh, due to the inland connectivity um, uh, across European countries, I think it can be can be managed. Thank you. Super insightful. Nathan, let's zoom uh, back into North America and the hotspots uh, right there. Give us the, the highlights. Yeah, I think one of the, the, the big hotspots right now is rail. Um, so rail is very congested, especially into the Chicago market. Um, we just saw that Dallas is now very congested as they're running out of chassis as well. And if you look at the, the numbers and you know, with cargo going down and everything, it's like, well, why is this happening? And it goes to those negative feedback loops and also talks back into the, the overstock of inventory. So what we're seeing are these trains are going into places like Chicago, Memphis, Dallas, um, loaded with cargo for these, these large retailers. 
and the large retailers can't take delivery of the cargo. So they are leaving the cargo stacked at the rail terminal. Um, these rail terminals aren't very big. They're not really designed for storage of cargo. They're designed for flow of cargo. So a train comes in, it gets offloaded, and that cargo is out of the terminal within about two days. So there's no real storage. So as the storage there backs up, uh, including on chassis storage, which now takes chassis out of the market, um, there's nowhere to put the, the next train coming in. So they have to park the next train coming in either prior to the terminal or into a siding, which delays that cargo coming in. Now that siding is taken up, that rail is taking up, it backs up even further. It backs up until you have um, something like 50 trains waiting at West Coast ports that can't dispatch to Chicago. These are loaded trains with containers um, that can't go anywhere. So we're seeing rail dwell on the West Coast um, spiking above 20 days right now. Um, really due to a downswing in cargo demand is, is driving the congestion. So um, really interesting situation. There's a lot of other things going on um, with rail right now in, in terms of uh, equipment um, utilization and um, uh, labor issues. Um, and it could probably be its own session, honestly, but um, that's one of the big stories. And then obviously on the East Coast, if you've been paying attention, there's about 30 plus vessels at Savannah um, still backed up. And then New York has about 19 vessels in backup. Um, very similar to the Rotterdam situation where you see vessel bunching. So several vessels, especially on the same service, will all come in within two or three days of each other. It doesn't give the cargo enough time to get out in town, turn around and come back to the port to be loaded then as an empty. So now you're holding onto these empties for 10 or 15 days. They're on chassis. There's no chassis. Can't pick up again. It's these negative feedback loops. And that's what you also see in that, that origin dwell story in China, that if you can't get back down to normal, you just keep bumping up, bumping up, bumping up as the next congestion comes in. So um, even at the current cargo levels, we're still seeing, you know, normal cargo demand, even though we're less than 2020, 2021. So we're going to still these, see these compounded issues um, persist um, and they're going to have to kind of be slowly chipped away um, through efforts of, of clients and forwarders and carriers to clear these situations out. Yeah, so even though demand and consumption is dropping, it'll take some time to uh, to clear the backlog. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, let's um, take a look at the next one here. Um, Nathan, keep going. You're the expert here. What to expect? <laughs> yeah. In terms the, of <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, the next hot button issue is, of course, West Coast labor negotiations. Um, I, I think the overall theme here is it's been quiet, and that's a good thing if you if you follow labor negotiations and sports, the, the last thing you kind of want to hear are the sides coming out and issuing press releases, um, uh, hitting on each other. The, the, what we've heard from both the PMA and the ILWU have all been positive. Um, they have been in negotiation every day from May 10th, except for a small break around Memorial Day. Um, neither side expects there to be a stoppage or a slowdown. They also don't expect a deal to be done by July 1st. I would not panic about that. That again is normal. Um, they are going to continue to work through the negotiation, but um, from what we've been hearing from all of our sources, the sides are not very far apart. Um, they're handing out some final details. However, it's, it's unfortunately a wait and see. They are being very close with their negotiation and aren't releasing much. Um, so un, until it comes out and until we see a final deal signed, um, we, will, we will wait patiently um, and, and hope for the best. Thanks, Nathan. So it's fair to say, uh, as a key takeaway, you remain optimistic uh, for now, but nothing is cast in stone yet. I am eternally optimistic. <laughs> That's good. Okay, L um, let's do another quick survey for uh, for, for the audience here. Uh, we talked um, early on um, about whether we should expect a normal uh, peak season in terms of a demand surge here in the third quarter, uh, more specifically in August and, and September, similar to what we normally see from a seasonality perspective. Um, so that's the million dollar question. Will we see a um, a, a peak come uh, Q3? Would love to, uh, to check with all of you how you see it. Uh, select any of the three options right here. Yes, expect a peak in Q3. No, not expected or the third one have uh, have zero idea basically select one of the three uh we we finish on a on a simple poll not not to keep things too complicated uh let's see what the uh the audience say in a in a couple of uh, in a couple of seconds
All right, let's uh, let's show the results. Okay, interesting. Close to half of uh, you all uh, think that uh, we are going to see a, a a peak. A third don't expect a peak, and uh, uh, the the remainder sixteen percent uh, no idea. Florian, Nathan, is this a surprise to you? A little bit. I'm, I'm the, at least into Europe, the the the, the fifty percent I still see a peak in Q3. So this comes a bit as a surprise, as it should have taken off already. So let's let let's see if it comes just a bit delayed, um, or it's maybe also driven by our American uh, 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 guests, so to say, where the peak starts a bit later as um, the transit times are shorter. Nathan. Yeah, I I do think there's going to be a peak. Um, I don't know what it's going to look like. Will it be a, a severe peak? Will it be what we normally see, you know, what we saw last year? But I do because, um, unfortunately, there's going to be this bull whip effect when it comes to inventories. Um, it takes a while to kind of restart shipping, especially if we're seeing congestion still at the ports and especially congestion into the inland locations. Um, those overstocks will turn into understocks very quickly and also seasonality, right? We're going to see back to school here very shortly. Then we're going to get into Christmas season and I am... I said I'm eternally optimistic. I'm always also optimistic of the American consumer. We will um, spend our way through issues. We saw that during COVID. Um, I even think with inflation, Americans will find a way. We we will always want to buy things. We will always want to celebrate our holidays. Um, so I I definitely think that there is going to be a a peak this year. Thank you both. Thanks for sharing, and thanks uh, for everyone dialing in and, and sharing their their insights and votes. Let's uh, let's recap it um, in terms of the overall takeaways. Um, so essentially, just to to uh, basically summarize everything we've talked about, starting from the left, uh, 2021 was all about the COVID economy, uh, the demand boom, uh, port and land side congestions, uh, which essentially led to all the to the supply constraints. Then, ever since we 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 saw a, a pretty normal uh, Chinese New Year uh, leading up to um, to February with a, a normal peak season, but uh, quite surprisingly, uh, we saw demand dropping faster than uh, normal uh, post Chinese New Year seasonalities. Then we've seen the uh, sad war in, in Ukraine, which has impacted uh, some of the European supply chains uh, and, and patents Florian talked about a little bit earlier and specifically uh, around the food sector. Um, we saw the, the Black Swan event with the, the Shanghai lockdown that basically uh, reduced uh, Shanghai exports by by more than than fifty percent. Um, then we've now seen uh, the European port congestions that that Florian uh, talked to us about, not to the level of what we've seen in some of the American ports, in particular LA Long Beach, uh, but nevertheless uh, big disruptions relative to the past. And uh, then um, we saw the event of uh, some of the the public financials from the big box retailers uh, that Nathan uh, talked to us about, where we essentially saw. Uh, quarter over quarter inventory uh, figures jumped uh, significantly, whilst at the same time uh, sales uh, data uh, reduced uh, significantly. And then uh, Nathan just spoke to us about uh, the labor negotiations uh, ongoing and what to expect there. Then, uh, as we just uh, pulled everyone on the on the call on right now, is what to expect in uh, in, in Q3. Is there a peak coming or not? Um, with that, uh, let's uh, summarize with some of the key takeaways in terms of uh, tactical recommendations uh, for all of you. Um, Florian uh, and, and, and Nathan would love your, your perspective on the, on the four key recommendations uh, here. Nathan, maybe you start and then we'll uh, finish off with you, Florian. Yeah, I think these are recommendations that we, we generally share with our, our clients. Um, two weeks minimum before CRD, make sure that you have your bookings in. Make sure that you have a good booking forecast and you're sharing that with your with your forwarder and with your operations uh, and logistics teams. Um, the, the spot offering, they're very attractive right now, but I would also say don't forget about your fixed. If you are a, a client with fixed contracts, you, those may be um, very valuable to later in the in the shipping season. Um, and resilient is another thing. Um, I, I think adaptability and flexibility have been what have broken out certain shippers from others. We've, we've seen those who can be resilient in their supply chain and, and adapt quickly to the change in the market, uh, do the best. And, and those who are a little bit more rigid and have longer decision-making cycles kind of fall behind the, the pack. Thanks, Nathan. Lauren, any final words from you? 
Yeah, I think the recommendation to book two weeks uh, in advance of the time already is a, is a good one, but even better might be just choose a provider that's able to create the transparency for you uh, uh, about schedule changes, origin delays, and then also can, can advise you what are the reliable services. So there's very big discrepancies in the market. Yeah? So, so there is some services that on average are only one day late. And, and then what does it matter? Okay, on-time performance isn't there, but it's only one day late. So choose those services and work with a provider that's able to, to, to give you this uh, um, information. Additionally, absolutely uh, look at the routing. Uh, as, as I said, if you, if you can avoid, for example, Hamburg, if, you, if, you, if your cargo that you urgently need is on a vessel that waits two weeks uh, um, uh, outside of Hamburg, then, then obviously that's a problem. But if you choose uh, Wilhelmshaven, Bremerhaven, Rotterdam, as an alternative that, uh, um, uh, that you, are, you, are, you, are, you are better off. Uh, and if it comes to, to, to spot rates uh, that might fall below the contracted rate, yes, um, it might make sense to, to a small proportion. Um, and if you have contracted rates, that might be, make sense to hedge your risk and say, okay, I've got a portion on, on contracted rates and I have a portion on spot rates, but plan that ahead. Don't change uh, um, back and forth as that will really harm your, 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 yeah, your reputation overall and it will lead to um, um, a problematic setup later on. So those contracted rates might be a real asset uh, uh, later in the shipping season. So don't give them up. Thanks, Florian. And thanks, Nathan. Thanks to both of you. Thanks, for, uh, thanks to everyone dialing in. Uh, we'll get back to any questions uh, in writing if we haven't already attended them in the app. And then feel free to reach out to uh, any three of us uh, subsequently. Thank you very much. Have a great day.